Today on Adorama Live on No Film School, we have an exciting discussion about why film school with industry insiders. But first, we take a look at Canon's mirrorless camera series, then our exciting panel with guests from NYU, USC, and No Film School. This is Adorama Live on No Film School. Welcome to Adorama Live on No Film School, where we talk to filmmakers and video professionals about techniques and technology. We are here on the NAB show floor of 2019 in Las Vegas. I am your host, Stephen Pierce. And of course, you can see all of the episodes of Adorama Live on nofilmschool.com. So please go check them all out. Today, I have a very exciting panel for all of you all. We're going to look at uh, film school and whether the typical university structure is the most advantageous for aspiring filmmakers. But first, I want to look at Canon mirrorless cameras. Now, mirrorless cameras are typically smaller and lighter weight than their DSLR counterparts. But in the last couple of years, the technology, the technology has advanced so much that they've caught up if not even surpassed in many cases, the legacy DSLR models. So I've continued to use Canon lenses and Canon cameras since I start, met Paul Hawkshurst, my first guest, when I was directing the show called Top Photographer. At that point, I was already a big fan of Canon's DSLRs and their L-series lenses. Since then, we've dug deeper and really gotten into the cinema lenses with them. Like even within this show, we're using the C700, C300 Mark II, and a C200 here with a 17 to 120 wide cine servo, and the 30 to 300 super cine zoom lenses power all of our zoom lenses here. But just because Canon makes these awesome cine packages doesn't mean that they've abandoned their DSLR and mirrorless line. In fact, their technology's grown even deeper. Here's a piece we made using DSLRs and DSL lenses from Canon mixed with cinema cameras and cinema lenses. Everybody roll, everybody roll. Roll it, hold on, hold. everybody rolling. Okay, cool, here we go, stand by. Give Matt the signal. Here we go. Me too. These guys are idiots. We've had a great night. You're Thank my you only so coverage there, Serena. Stay Thank there. Thank you to Amanda Fuller tonight. One more time for Baby Shay. Go, Baby Shay. Go, camera one. Go. Here we go. Ready for four. Ready five. Five. Three. Ready two. Two. Nice job, guys. Ready one. One. Two. Go to her face, you got it, just keep it going. You got it, just keep that move going. Ready, four, stay there, stay there. Ready, one. One, coming two, four, ready. Four. Ready, one. One. Coming in two, two. Go up, go up, two, tilt up. Ready, pull your mouth. Five. One. Ready, four, four. Ready, one, and one. Ready, two, two. Ready, three, three. Ready, one, one.
please welcome my first guest today, my friend Paul Hawkshurst from Canon. Paul, it's awesome having you, man. Oh, thanks, man. It's good to see you. Always great to, <laughs> to hang out with you. Good to see you, too. So really? I want to just get it out of the way. Um, yeah. Let's just do kind of a spec rundown <clears throat> of what's in the Canon mirrorless camera lineup, and specifically what yeah. models these are. So this is the, the Canon EOS R. So this is our first full-frame mirrorless camera. Now, before that, we had the, the EOS M cameras. They were super, super 35, ASPS-C in the still world. Uh, size sensors, and it was a totally different line. This is the first time we really kind of took hold of the full frame and decided to go, let's put it into a mirrorless camera. Um, and what, doing that, by shortening the flange depth of the EF mount, we had to create a new mount. And so the big thing is the, uh, the RF mount. So this. you can pull it out here. So it's a brand new mount, and thus brand new lenses across the board. Um, the reasoning behind that is because the EF mount has a much larger flange depth, and that's the distance from the sensor to the lens mount. It's much, much longer. Um, it's 44 millimeters. We're on the R, and the all featured mirrorless full-frame cameras from Canon, it's actually a 20, mil 20 millimeter flange so depth. So much closer. Much, much, much closer, closer to the sensor. Uh, and that means that you have to make new lenses for it. Of but course. what that allows us to do, the, the really exciting thing about that is that it allows us to rethink how we design lenses. Um, and what lens is this here we have? Okay, so this is actually kind of the unique one of the original len uh, release of lenses. This is the 28 to 70 uh, F2. You mind if I hold lens. that bad boy? Yeah. 28 to 70. So you lose yeah. a couple millimeter from like the couple <coughs> typical 24 to Yeah, you think of the 24 to 70. Yeah. The, but the 24 but to 70 you had, it was uh, F2.8. Right. You know, or F4 if you wanted to have image stabilization. And I'm sorry, so what you said? This is F2? F2 across wow. the board. Uh, yeah. All Canon mirrorless lenses, the L mount lenses are F2? No, that, no, 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 no. These are, each lens is, again, is going to be, you know, very specialized. So, like this one right here, 24 to 105, uh -huh. this is an F4. This gotcha. is very similar to its EF brother. I see. You, know. you mean this one's going to be F2 throughout its full zoom range? Throughout the zoom range, gotcha. exactly. exactly. 28 yeah. to 70. Gotcha. Copy and that. It's a, it's a product that, while it may have been possible in EF mount, it would have been unwieldy in EF mount. It would have been a much, much larger, uh, almost impossible to use lens. Um, but because of the changes in the mounts, we're able to rethink how we design lenses uh, and create something in this size. So. Yeah, it's really exciting, and for me, that's the most exciting part of the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. So, so do you have, uh, let's let's talk about kind of more of the creative background, specifically in the video of the mirrorless lineup. Yeah. What is, when I pick up a Canon mirrorless mm -hmm. camera, and I'm, a, I'm an independent video, uh, video ma filmmaker, yeah. what, what is, what's the heart of the mirrorless camera? Okay, so for me, when I think about the EOS R, when I think about video on it, uh, first of all, you know, it has 4K in it, so 4K, 4K up to 30p, but that's kind of, not what's important to me. The big thing is that it has Canon log in okay. it. Okay, gotcha. So we're kind of bridging a gap a little bit, clo edging, edging closer, closer, closer to our cinema. Right. Line right that. And um, a lot of feedback that I get from my clients and just in general use, you know, me on you, is that finally we have a DSLR size or a mirrorless size camera that I can integrate into my Canon cinema workflow. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, the piece you just showed, we were using the 5D Mark III, I believe, in that right. one with the L-series lenses. So that was like 2.8 that we're matching with these big cinema zooms. Yeah. And yeah, we were having to go down, we're dropping the sharpness by one, we're removing the saturation, put it in the neutral, I think. Right, we're using setting. like cine style. Yeah. So you, you, you didn't right. have the Canon log in it. You it had kind to of a, do, yeah, yeah, you kind of had to build your own right. color profile, but this has mm -hmm. Canon log built in just like the cine series. Exactly. And so, and on top of that, so internally, when you're recording internally, you get an 8-bit 420 right. uh, to your SD card. On like right. a f MPEG-4, H.264 exactly. codec usually, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, but if you go external from this camera, you're getting a 10-bit 422 output. That's amazing. And so uh -huh. that's, that's actually matches incredibly with all of our cinema products. So that's, I mean, that's great because that means mm -hmm. you can use something that you're going to need anyway. Like if you're using these a lot, you're typically going to end up with an Atomos or an external recorder of some form. Right, exactly. But now you can do kind of a, a less bit rate compressed, like a 422, right? Yeah, so 10, 10, you know, bit. 10 yeah. bit color depth, um, Canon log, 422, 
And you, I mean, you kind of, in a way, you have a, a like a, a baby cinema camera. And for me, that so. equates to, I did some 8-bit versus 10-bit testing right last year uh, on yeah. the Atomo Sumo um, with the C200, actually, because we could do the, we did, you know, full, uh, right. yeah, we did the full, um, I forget the, can the, the the native format in the C200 the um, that shoots the CF card. Yeah. You did the RAW. The, the RAW, yeah. The RAW light. The RAW, yeah, the yeah. RAW light, and I did the MPEG-4 and then a 10-bit, and I compared all of them, and that was yep. really what's interesting about 10-bit versus 8-bit is 8-bit, you kind of see start seeing your highlights go away much, much faster. You don't have any ability to do that. 10-bit kind of saves yeah. you a lot. Yeah, the 8-bit kind of opens you up to some artifacts that you really right. have to watch out for, whereas, you know, just pushing it to the 10-bit even, it's a little bit, you know, a little bit freer. You can, you don't need to worry about some of those artifacts. And Absolutely. Banding and stuff like that. So, so these are, again, are pretty, they're, much lighter than much much lighter than yeah. the DSLRs that I'm familiar with. Absolutely. Like the Mark when you get rid of that mirror, you know, a lot happens, and so. I mean, yeah, the form factor goes way mm -hmm. down, and that's yeah, that's kind of about mirrorless, right? It's that you just remove that mirror, so it's yeah. doing its own. This is essentially an EVF, like an electronic viewfinder. It's an electronic viewfinder. Yeah, exactly. Great. So, so just like again on a cinema camera. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing though is that you one thing about getting you know it's it's all good to go and get lighter and lighter as possible, but you don't want to lose the form factor. And I think that's something that Canon did really well, with, especially with the EOS R, is that they made a nice compromise where they made the form factor. You know, you could make this camera much, much, much smaller, but if you're holding it with two fingers in your hand, that's not an ideal way to operate a camera. Right. Honestly, so, you almost want that. Uh, you know, you want to be able to. I remember the Mark III's. You had to like kind of get your wrist in front of it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And hold it like this one. You could even just get right underneath it. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the adapters that you have here. You mentioned this is a new yeah. mount. I assume these are some so, adapters to work with the EF lenses? So one thing of being a new mount is that we now we have to make all new lenses. Right. And so, you know, we can't just come out with a thousand lenses, different lenses all at the same time. So we're going to have to trickle those lenses out. People still want to use all the lenses. There's, you know, there's 175 million I can't. I don't know the number. Don't quote me. On no, that no, number. no. The, the, L, the L series <laughs> is the L series. Everybody owns. Yeah, I, I still know. own a bunch of L series, and I don't. I mean, I don't think we have any even out EF yeah. mount lenses. They're just. So, they're like I've owned them for so long. Exactly. I know them so, so well. Many, I don't want to like. Oh. And people and they're great lenses, and yeah. people don't want to give them up, and you shouldn't have to give them up. So, uh, Canon's designed a series of adapters um, to work with those EF lenses, and what's really unique is that we don't just have a regular EF to our adapter. Uh, we have a couple new ones. First off is this adapter that has a built-in uh, filter. Oh, wow. Into it. So we can add behind the lens filtration to our EF glass when we put it on the R camera. So, so just gonna does that kind of replace the screw adapters? Or not maybe replace, but it adds what you could put on the front. So like exactly. the V filters, UV right. filters, whatever you want to do, but it's a back insert. Yeah, it's a, a back insert. insert. And so, and the big thing about it too is that, so we have a couple flavors right out of the box. We have a polarizer. So there's a little dial. It's hard to see here, but there's a little dial on here. Yeah, do you mind if I take um, that? Yeah, there? take it. Play this with is, it. So I don't know if you can see this here on the camera, but yeah, I see it says minimum, and then go to medium, yeah. mid, and max. And that's a par circular polarizer? So we have two. We have a circular polarizer, and we have a variable ND oh, as well. Oh, wow. So that's, this is more of uh -huh. the variable ND right here. And you uh -huh. can actually see it's labeled and it says BND. variable ND right there on the side yeah. that makes sense then, but you have another one so, that's amazing that's so useful so, to have that in the back end yeah. where you could literally just kind of crank it up exactly and you yeah. have that filtration you don't need to worry about you know because all different lenses are all different front diameters you have right. to worry about that you know well that's now also we good if you're like doing a dock and you know what I mean you're shooting real light key and like and yeah. I'm, I'm just you know I'm just spitballing here but you're like two eight inside or like you go from one lit room to another yes yeah. this, this feels like it's not doing it in steps it's going smoothly right. throughout everything so I wonder right. if that isn't gonna already be kind of a nice smoother transition exactly. as those like usually get them in that third stop chunk you know you know what it's funny that you talk about that actually mm -hmm. the stepping so we're all used to using L series lenses or any kind of electronic lens um, that has the iris built inside and you control the iris electronically, right? Yes. So we're used to how it steps down. Right. On the EOS R, in video mode, we can do a 1 8 step iris. Wow, so like and you're so, talking, you're going from a third to an eighth. Exactly. And so when you look at it, when you, you know, perceptually, it's a nice, smooth, seamless step down. Right. I've been in post and before so. whenever somebody's like changed aperture and been like trying to keyframe right. a curves adjustment and match something across a shot. Yeah. But that's really awesome. And it's something that comes from the lenses themselves, actually. It's, it's the marriage of the body and the lens. Um, we have a lot more context um, between the camera and the lenses now. So we're able, there's a lot more information passing between them than with the EF to the EF mount. 
no. So last questions here. Mm -hmm. um, let's do a price comparison to DSLRs. Where does this fall within your price points? Yeah, so this, you know, this guy comes in about 2300 Great. right here. Yeah. We have another model called the RP, and I didn't bring it, but it's an entry-level model. It's a, it's a camera, if you're familiar with the 6D on the DSL side, mm -hmm. where that was really kind of a, an entry-level DSLR for full frame. We also have the RP, which is an entry-level mirrorless full-frame camera, and that comes in at $1,300. Uh, you can come see it at the Canon booth. We have plenty of them to play with. Um, it's not as powerful on the video side, but it's really kind of meant for people who want to, to dip their hands into full frame. Well, at so. $1,300, that's a really, I mean, you're kind of, you're splitting that difference between 2,000 is too much for two people, right. but they have around like 1,000, so now you can mm -hmm. just, if you could stretch it just a little bit more, now you get into a mirrorless format that you can really start start experimenting it, with. Exactly, you know, and if you get in and you try it, and if you like the mirrorless, then you can just start building from there. Great. Well, so. Paul, it's awesome having you again. I always Thanks. love getting to hang out and chat with yeah, you, Yeah, absolutely. At Saturday Night Live, I had the great experience of working with a company called The Mill. And if you're not familiar with The Mill, go check their work out right now. It's very, very mind-blowing. From visual effects to animation, and how I worked with them the most, color correction. I was always amazed when I'd be editing a piece and I'd put in a reference color, something to kind of get us through and establish a look as we're reviewing it and try and decide how it's going to look as a piece. But then when I'd get the finished color back from the mill, it was so much more nuanced and textured and I was always just amazed at the work that they did. So I partnered up with Josh Bohosky, my friend who's an award-winning colorist at the mill, for a Western short film to try and capture his process of color correction. We do feature films, commercials, music videos. We cover everything from color to VFX to emerging tech. Hi, my name is Josh Bohosky, and I am a colorist. This is one of our color suites. And I'm working on the Western short film Bang Bang with Stephen Pierce. Bang. Welcome back, Stephen. No, oh, thanks, Josh. <laughs> so I'll first sit down with the client and see what their vision is. But we want it to feel extremely typical Western. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. And from there, I'll go and give my initial first pass, where I'll just go through and get it in the world that I like, where it's balanced. And then from there, we'll go in and start nitpicking and being like, all right, maybe we should pop the skin tone or the shirt or desaturate this or this highlight's too bright. So the first thing we should do, I think, is just kind of look at some references to films that we're trying to replicate. Okay. So I've pulled in a couple stills from The Assassination of Jesse James and True Grit for us to look at. Okay. And just kind of looking at these references, you see that it's a lot more desat. You see it on the scope too, it's just all kind of sitting. Pulled in stills of that to see a reference of those worlds and then put our own little flair onto it. Steve had actually already done his own initial color pass on it, which is kind of a reference to the direction he wanted to go. So here's what you gave me. Uh -huh. It's not too far off, we're just a little bit more desaturated. We had some really great moments on certain shots and it was just taking that and making sure it was consistent throughout. Effectively, we ended up bringing his color vision to life. The title shot, we wanted it to be moody. We went a little bit more saturated than the rest of the pieces. So I'm just keying the sky so I can give it a little color separation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's also a little brighter, yeah. So we could totally just put a little bit more blue into there. We went a little darker than the reference, just so that the title pops at the beginning. Wow, that looks so much more fun. So we could jump into like one of these interior scenes. So you're matching the windows even from the reference like real clear. Yeah, so you want to get that. Whenever we see his face, he's super subtle on the makeup, mm. and I want to see if we can maybe pull out him. Gotcha. Yeah, like trying to get like that white pull paint that out a little bit. Yeah. Out. yeah, exactly. <laughs> one of the main things we did going through this is we kept an eye on all of the makeup on the clowns and making sure that the white was really white and very noticeable. So I work on the base light, which has great ability to do keying and tracking. So you're really able to isolate on specific colors or off illuminance and then flawlessly track it. Oh yeah, that's definitely working. Go Dude, again, that's like exactly back. what it needs to be. <laughs> that yeah, looks Dope. <laughs> <laughs> you totally like fixed like a major concern. <laughs> so we did like the bartender and then like the drunk clown that's passed out next to the villain. He could be probably the most saturated character in the whole thing. We made sure to pop out the rosy red in him. Another thing that we're playing with, because Steve was so concerned about the white makeup, was to also make sure that the rest of the skin tones felt natural and saturated. So 
there's a shot like of a whole, him pulling out the gun from the holster and we just kind of brought out the warmth in his skin. Gotcha. So you're just gonna isolate out his hands and shift yeah. it around a little bit. For the shot where the bartender is getting the gun, we brought that down to just set it more into a filmic atmosphere, not have those bright popping lights everywhere. In our first initial pass, we really were referencing True Grit for the outside, and then we graded the inside, and then when we washed it down, there was a bit of a jolt between the two. So you're just making a secondary to grab just the highlights. Yeah. And push it in just a little blue. So I'd do that, and then I would do a key just to get the blue here. And then obviously I don't want his jacket so I can tone it down to get rid of all the shadows. So I'm just getting those highlight blues, mm -hmm. which is where the sky is. And then from there, I can just push yeah, it's a real subtle difference, but I think it makes a it look little. more natural, actually. So we kind of put a little bit of more saturation to the outside and made it a little warmer, so it felt more cohesive. Oh, I think we probably do want to bring out the, the bang flag, right? Yeah. And then for the ending with the gun, with the bang, we made sure to go through and saturate the red and pop that out, but not have it be too cartoonish, but a little bit of that cartoon flavor in it. We vignetted it, just focus your eye in, and also just balance from the shots before because there's not as much shadow in that shot that was in the before and after shots of it. And then after all this, we'll go through match and add grain and all kinds of crap. Exactly. So after we went through and graded the piece, we went and applied a nice little film grain layer to it, softened it on the highlights and the shadows so it would just kind of bloom in the middle and not be too harsh on either side. Yeah, so my favorite to use is we have some 35 mil grain that we scanned here back in the day. Oh wow. Just kind of has more of an organic feel to it than using just like a digitized grain. We went with one that doesn't have any specks in it or dust going through it. Because sometimes when you apply that across onto a shot, you can notice the repetition of it and the same specks hitting and hitting and hitting. So we went clean in that essence. This piece was super exciting to work on. You know, it's always great when you get to work on something that has a style or a look to it and you really get to go in and manipulate it and try different things and capture a certain tone. Obviously, it's always great working with a good friend like Steve. I hope this video was informative and you got some interesting information about how to color and how to tackle a look. Bye. <laughs> I didn't go to film school. Um, I actually went to school for theater, but a lot of my colleagues and friends did go to film school. So it comes up on set quite often or over drinks after work about whether or not the liberal arts degree is fully worth it and what the value of it is. So I wanted to continue that discussion today and I brought along a few people that can help me discuss this. We brought Mary Weingarten. She's from the University of Southern California. Mary, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Bankert from Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Charles Hain from Fierstein Graduate University Film School. George Edelman, Senior Editor at No Film School. And Michael Yanovich, a professional editor. Thank you all very much for coming here and hanging out today. Our pleasure. <laughs> so the way I think this should work is I, I don't want to get too stuffy with this, and I don't want to be too formal. I think it should be a discussion and not a me ask you answer. We go down the line. I, I don't think we should do that. I think we should I'll ask, and let's kind of talk. And if somebody has a follow-up, feel free to throw it out there. And, you know, I think you're all artists or attached to the art world, so we understand that kind of give and take respect, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully. <laughs> Does that work for all of you guys? Great. We can, we can try. <laughs> all right. Let's give it a shot. Okay, so the first question I have is kind of specifically for you, Scott, and you, Mary. What is the one thing, if you could have something that students take away from film school, like a graduate, what are the, what's like if you could have one thing, what would they remember? Okay, I'll start, but it's going to be more than one thing. Oh, boy. <laughs> but it'll be quick. So I think what's most important for, for film school uh, students um, to get out of a program is to learn how to tell stories. Uh, and learn to collaborate and to create networks uh, with their colleagues. And I think those are the three most important things. So networking and learning how to network and establish the connections with people. That's right, but also collaborating on the set because if you can't do that, you're not going to work. Scott, do you, what do you think about that? Uh, I'd say to add on to it, to find the fingerprint of your own creative curiosity, intellectual and creative. It's higher education, you're there to learn, but also who are you, what's your voice? and have the, sp the safe space and time to grow and develop that voice before you go out. 
yeah, I, I agree with that too. So yeah. a great follow-up to this question, so just so we can establish where we all went. I, I, we know I went to theater school. Um, who, did you all go to film school? Clown college for me. <laughs> so George is clown college. I, I got a BA in a completely unrelated communication degree, but no film school. No film school for you. How about you, Charles? Uh, I went to the USC Graduate <laughs> School of Cinema Television. Hey, so. That's right. That's just what it was called a while ago. Uh, I went to film school, BFA, Film and Television at NYU. And I got a BA from University of Michigan in uh, interdisciplinary program, took film, but I do not have a BFA and did not go to grad school. Wow. All right. So th those of you that did go, do you feel find yourself using your film degree in your professional work, or do you think it was worth it? I mean, so for me personally, it's worth it because I always knew I wanted to teach, and an MFA is really a teaching credential in a lot of ways. So because I knew teaching was a goal, grad school was not something that was a tough debate for me. I think if you're not interested in teaching, it's a different decision that involves a lot of different things to think about. But the thing I use continuously that I got out of film school more than anything else is like a habit of learning. Like there's this idea in film school that so many people get into where they're like, I'm gonna learn in the beginning and then in my thesis, I'm gonna demonstrate all I know. And what a lot of people realize, I think even by their thesis is how little they still know and how much they're gonna have to continue to learn. And so one of the biggest things I got out of a graduate education was sort of like the learner's mind, the student mind of, I don't know everything. I'm never going to know everything. This is an incredibly complicated thing we want to do with our lives, telling stories with moving pictures. And that habit of learning that I really got into of like, do a thing, learn from it, do a thing, learn from it, do a thing, learn from it. And that I really got in a film school environment because I would do a thing and then I would show it to my, a group of my peers I trusted and learn from it. That habit has helped me so much as I've continued through my career. Well, so I may ask you, what'd you go to undergrad for? I went to undergrad for English. I, I, I read a lot of books. It was awesome. <laughs> so would you say the same thing about an English degree though? Well, except I wasn't writing a novel twice a semester and then sharing it with my peers and learning from it. That process of putting yourself online, identifying who you are as a creator or trying to, sharing it with groups of people that you respect and getting their responses from it was something that I wasn't doing in an English degree necessarily. And it, and it was a process that I really got out of film school. I think you can get that from an undergrad or a grad. I would say that's kind of the same experience I had in uh, my undergrad is I kind of learned how to learn and create and not ask permission to do something to just go do something but I think everyone takes something different out of any undergrad degree so um, next question to follow that up so how does self-teaching so there are lots of resources on the internet and more so than I think ever before how does self-teaching compare to a university degree what are the compare and contrast them for me well, it's different for every topic, right? Like if a film school is still trying to teach you stuff that it would have had to teach you in the 80s. In the 80s, the only way you could learn exposure in three-point lighting was in a classroom, right? But now there's like eight-minute web tutorials that are so efficient at the basics of exposure that it's like, should we be spending our class time on that or should we be spending our class time on other things? I think a good film school is responsive to the fact that some things are best self-learned and some things are not. And, you know, we shouldn't ignore the power of platforms like No Film School and other places where you can read and learn and grow and like YouTube in general. But we need to like incorporate that stuff. No students are learning stuff there and focus on the things you can't get from those experiences. Yeah, George. Yeah, I mean, for, you know, I, I did actually go to college. I went to undergrad at Occidental College and I did do film and visual arts there. And, you know, I was lucky enough to shoot on 16 and Actually, I did get the benefit of some of a USC graduate program education because one of my very close friends went to the graduate program and I was, as a producer, he could have a producer on his projects that wasn't a student, so I got to produce a bunch of thesis films at USC without going. Uh, so I got to learn a, bit, a little bit that way. It, it, to me, the value of a film school seems more and more that you may meet and make connections with people who may hire you 100%. and work with you. And that could be true of things that aren't film school too. Uh, like, you know, when I came up in LA, I did a thing called Channel 101, which was like an online community of people making comedy shorts. It was like an online festival. And it kind of predated YouTube or was around the same time that YouTube really hit. And we just submitted projects. We watched them, we voted on them, and we learned, and we learned by doing. And uh, those people, and some of them didn't go to college at all or go to film school, a lot of them are working in the, in the industry, and they hired a lot of the rest of us. So I think the value of a community that you can learn with and grow with is, is what film school can offer. Because a lot of the information is there, 
And one of the things we do at New, No Film School, or we try to do, is you may go to film school and learn a lot of the basics, and you may forget, and you may need to brush up. So we're there, so you not so you don't go to film school, but so if you went and you want to come back and remember, how do I do this? How do I do that? What's this new camera? Because we shot on this when I was at film school. That was 10 years ago, and no one uses that anymore. What do they use now? Those are the kinds of things that, um, that's, that's the value, I think, that we bring. Yeah, and I, I would just back to your original question. I think it's a complex, it's complex, because it also depends for grads and undergrads. It's a different experience. It's also different for different individuals where they are in their undergrad career. Like some, some undergrads will, will take undergraduate school and sort of treat it like a grad program and come out ready to go. Um, and I also think for film schools, it is a bit of a challenge to balance the teaching of the technical with the, all the other things that need to be taught, the finding your voice, um, and storytelling, and I think that's a challenge. So I want to kind of jump in on something you said there, George, about like college creating a community for which you can learn how to create, but then online resources and technical resources can give you other, you know, other resources. Well, don't you think that, I mean, especially in the more and more digital world, there are these communities that exist digitally, like, you know what I mean? I don't think you necessarily, you know, have to go to a place where you are forced into a social environment. Rather, people find the niches they enjoy online, and do you think that that's supplement like, do you think that's enough? I well, I think it depends. I mean, there's like there's our filmmakers on Reddit. <laughs> you can learn a lot there. You can learn a lot at No Film School. You can learn a lot uh, just creating stuff, posting it, and seeing all the comments. If you can stand the bad ones. To, um, to clarify your point, I believe everyone on Reddit is either a filmmaker or an IT person. I think that's <laughs> the entire Reddit community. I think also you have to be careful though of the uh, accuracy of the information. You know, crowdsourcing your information for how to make a film, even down to a camera's specifications, validating your workflow. I do a lot of that at NYU, and one thing I find is when we crowdsource it, problems happen. You know, it's good to have a free exchange of ideas, but understanding that at some point it has to work. Right. Yeah. Michael, how did you, yeah, I see you're jumping in. I want to ask you, how did you learn what you do? You did not go to film school, right? I did not go to film school. So, but you're still an established professional editor. Yes. And so how, how did you learn how to do it? Trial and error. <laughs> and that's one thing you'll you'll get that at film school too. When you make your own projects, you're going to learn by doing, and you're going to make mistakes, and you better make mistakes because you're going to learn more from those and everything else. And I think film school gives you that community where you're going to be forced to make projects together. You're going to be forced to try on different hats and do different roles, uh, and that's great. I did a lot of that on my own with my friends. I found that it's before the web took off. You know, I'm a bit older. These these projects have been going on. We got video cameras, digital revolution was just starting, you could barely edit a movie or short at home, and we would just go out and shoot our own stuff. We didn't have the technical resources, we kind of had to make it up as we went, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, nothing I would really show easily these days, but it was all a learning experience, and over time, through connections you make, you eventually start finding your way into the projects. I didn't go down the road into films where I am now, easily. It took a lot of work to get there because I didn't have the connections you get from film school and I didn't know where to start or what path to take. It was all finding my way in the dark. So that's another downside to it. It can be done. It's just going to take more work. Yeah, I mean, I had the same experience, I believe, also. Where we always say, is like kind of a mantra, I know what I'm doing because I've done it wrong a hundred times, you know, sure. something like that. It's like, so if we screw it up enough, eventually, hopefully, you'd learn from it. And I think I've screwed up enough that I've learned a few things, and I still have a lot more things to mess up. Yeah, All right. and I want to just add, I, my background is very similar to yours. Um, I was in the industry for 20 years before I worked at USC, and I figured it out myself. I worked for free when I came out of school and I worked as an editor and I struggled, struggled and got my, worked my way up. But I think that what you do get from film school and what I see at USC is that you're learning from professionals. And I think that's different than the online communities. Not only the misinformation of workflow that comes, that you can get from online communities, but just really learning the crafts from professionals who do it still every day or and you um, learn faster that way that's right well just also, to play devil's just play devil's advocate on that point though again 
and this is kind of building into my next point, isn't it and isn't apprenticeship, specifically if, if you know you want to make movies, right? A lot of the greatest DPs come from the grip and electric department. I don't know any single filmmaker I've worked with that's come out of film school that knows anything about grip and electric. Just, I mean, I've talked all across the country from all different schools. I don't know a single person Los out of school. L.A. City College has a full semester grip class, and it's one of my favorite things about L LAC. I taught there for eight years. They turn out people who have good set skills. Yeah, but isn't my point being, so isn't it more, but couldn't it possibly be more valuable? And again, don't take this as me taking a side. I'm just asking the question. Couldn't it be more valuable to spend that time and save the student loans and the hundreds of thousands of dollars and go straight into an apprenticeship and go on set working with people as a PA or as a, you know, a junior grip? You're going to do all of that in film school. You're going to take the classes. You're going to learn. You're going to take your gen eds and all of that. Then you're going to work on student productions, and you're going to freelance, and you're going to maybe, if your camera, try to get into the union, do those things. So I think students realize that, and they're ticking off all the boxes, the ones that are really on it. Yeah, I'll say I, on the uh, USC thesis films I worked on uh, as a producer, I did a lot of PAing as a producer, and I learned a lot about a real set that way. Um, there's a lot of value to that. I'd also say, though, that one of the things we try to do at a no film school is we try to connect professionals, like these two guys in particular, uh, writing about their process. So they are teaching through the internet to pe a class of infinite size by sharing their experiences about particular topics that we research that we find that our community really wants to learn about. And one of the cool things we can do is connect the dots between, we, we've had, you know, I've interviewed uh, directors at Sundance now who have their features there, who learn to make a movie on no film school. So we can connect, we've raised filmmakers, we can also connect the aspirational people to the professionals at, at various levels. But I will say, like, I learned a lot about what a set looks like through USC without having gone there, so I got lucky, but. Mary's been trying to jump in for like, a second. Yeah, I'm just gonna yeah, cut well, you off, I think I would say they're both viable, um, but I think now, and I think it's different than it was maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, now you do get an, have an edge in when you go to film school because you can learn the crafts um, and you do have more um, of an ability to get work. So, um, but I think the financial piece is something that has to be considered, there's no question. So since you've gone down that path anyway, I think it, this is a good, I have a question that, was a, that I want to ask. So is financial situation something that should be considered whenever you're choosing to go into film school specifically? Like, so if you come from an affluent background or a middle class background where, your parent, where possibly your parents can help you in it or, you know, whatever, that, that background, is, is that something to consider? I, I think it is something to consider, and I think some of the big film schools like USC are very aware of that, and scholarships are out there if you, if you can't go because of money. But I think, yeah, you have to think about, and it's the same is true for any undergraduate degree. It's just the world we live in right now. You have to look at the, the student loan debt you're going to have and uh, the, the potential career. There's no question. But so Fierstein is a mission-driven school. We're a public university, so we're like an affordable graduate school. That's part of the purpose of our existence. 50% female, 40% students of color, but like a grad degree. We always say less than a third of the price than our competitors. But the problem beyond that is actually not just the decision to go to film school. And yeah, you need to look at your finances for that. But it's also that the transition period from film school to a career is one where you still need to look at that. I have a friend who just got an MFA at a very good school. And at his first internship, the internship supervisor was like, so like, do you need money? Which is a question that comes up in film all the time because so many film interns legitimately don't. Like, they're from a family where they'll be okay. And so I think as part of that decision you need to be making of, do I go to film school or not? You also need to be strategizing. Like, if I need to make a living, which most people do, you need to be thinking about how am I gonna make inroads into the film industry, knowing that this is an industry in which people will legitimately ask you that question which is an insane question. It's really. also a big problem. We have a, I mean, one of the problems in film and television is that we have a lack of diversity in voices, certainly with economic diversity, and it hurts the end result, and that's because who can afford to take jobs for free, be an yeah. intern, do an apprenticeship, take on debt? Not, not a very diverse group of people, certainly not an ec economically diverse group of people, and I think it does harm the quality of the products we see on the screen. And let's remember that is not an assured way to make a living. You know, you can do great for a couple of years and have some dry spells where you're not making any money. The whole industry is a risk, and, and that's okay. If your passion is to do it, your passion is to do it. 
But I don't care who you are, there's no guarantee of money until you're in the very top echelon, and that's not even a permanent thing necessarily. It's also really yeah. frustrating, going back to your climbing the ladder thing, that all of the entry level jobs in this industry work insane hours six days a week. That's true. So like if you're like so, I so do the top end jobs. They all do. <laughs> right. I know, it's horrible. Yeah. Like that's why, why we're in education. Now. Yeah, wait, why yeah, why, you why don't do we do this again? Why does <laughs> anybody do this? I would say too though for the schools, it's on the school to provide the financial aid and we're often all schools are in this predicament of keeping up with the industry, keeping up with new cameras. Well, what is the capital uh, expenditure this year, but what is the amount for scholarships and that's the tricky thing when you want to add diversity and have, hear everybody's voice. And part two of that is having the film school continue to shepherd the student into the industry through outreach, not only internships, but allowing students to come back to the school to maybe edit a project, help with grant writing. We're doing that a lot in our grad program, but it's a, a big vision that we have is to get students out there to give them that kind of boost, but to stay with them, not just say, you graduated, you're on your own. I want to step back to diversity really quick because I think it's an important thing that has been brought up and I wanted to comment on that. So we've established kind of that affluent people have an advantage in generally in an arts degree background. I think it's, but how do we, what are the steps to start counteracting that? I think you're starting to begin on that. And on, and, and then I have a follow-up question on that same thing based on admissions. Well, I think diversity um, at, um, it just has to be a proactive initiative. It's not just going to happen. And I think there need to be uh, scholarships that are diversity driven, that there need to be donors that are giving, um, making money available for students of, of color and for women so that we um, can filter that into creating a more diverse um, industry. But I think it's up to the schools to do that. I think it's uh, K through 12. I think it has to happen in the public school system way before the university. I think there should be money and partnerships in the industry for students to be telling their stories at that age and building a portfolio before they even get to the university level. I also think it really requires a diverse faculty where you have examples of people in the classroom where people can say, oh, all right, this person is like me, this person didn't come from family connections and they look like me or they otherwise represent me and they can tell me exactly how they made it in and we can help each other. Like I come from a 30,000 person town in rural Illinois. I had no industry connections whatsoever. And while I can't talk about like other aspects of diversity, I can certainly talk frequently to my students about like the effort you have to put into when you don't have a cousin who happens to be a grip who can give you some information about how this industry works. And I try and bring that to the classroom. And at Fierstein, we're working really hard to make our to make sure our faculty reflects our student body because we think that's an important way to address a diverse industry. Throwing something in there, you're talking about having to work hard. I, I will say the internship route. If you're going to be an intern, the vast majority of interns suck. And that's really good for you because all you got to do is work hard and oh show God. that you're a good intern. Every good intern I've seen has succeeded. It may take some steps, but you will be noticed. If you're a PA or an intern on a project, I don't care if it's a production company or on a set, work your butt off and show you're worth it because most of the interns I've seen have been really bad. That is 100% yeah. true. The good great ones advice. Rise to the top. The, uh, I've seen it over and over. The great advice. All the PAs that we work with, the first person that always talks to me after the shoot at our company is uh, the, pr the is the producers. and They, they want to know who the good ones are. Well, they know who the good ones are, and they put them on everything. And yep. those people become ACs, become camera operators, become grips. They go to wherever they want after a while, but they, the producers love that. I want to go back to admissions because I think this is a really important question that I want to get into. So you look at something like visual art. The best art typically in music to me comes from, you know, not always from the easiest path. You know, it comes from people that have had life experiences, sometimes at young ages. So specifically looking at graduate admi admissions, how do you evaluate somebody trying to go to film school? How much of it is based on past work? Because while there are phones and things, people, I didn't start beginning thinking linearly about how to shoot something until I was in my 20s. So, you know, actively thinking about it. So how do you evaluate that when you're trying to admit somebody into an undergrad program that's 16, 17, 18 years old? Well, I, I think that, I mean, I'm not involved actually in directly in admissions at USC, but um, we do require a portfolio and the different programs are, are different. But I think what we're looking for is somebody who has something to talk about, stories to tell, something from the heart. And obviously they, they need to try and put together some visuals to show that they know how to translate that into visuals. But I think that certainly for us, we're not looking for any technical expertise. I mean, that, that you learn as you go, and that's not what makes great filmmakers. Yeah, I would just agree, follow up with that. I'm not on emissions either, but 
what does the person have going on in their head, you know, through interview process, through writing samples, show us who you are and what, what you feed on, what kind of gets you going. And that's, that's what's going to make a, a bright student and a successful filmmaker. So, so Fierstein is a startup, which means everybody does everything. So I am also involved in admissions. Uh, I hope to someday that we grow big enough that I get to say I'm not, but we're not there yet. And the two things, going back to your comment, is everybody at this point has access to making something with a camera on their phone. But what we're not looking for is like a beautifully polished thing. We're looking for how someone talks about the thing they made. Right? So if they turned it in and they're like, here's what I'm really proud of. I'm proud I made something at all. And I'm proud of this part. And I'm frustrated by this part. That's really more interesting to us. Whereas someone's like, yeah, I made this amazing short film. And we watched it and we're like, is it? Like, that's less useful. So, like, even if it's not good, if someone can talk about what they learned from it and that where they want to grow, that's really useful. And then the other thing we look for is, again, NYU, USC, the same thing, storytelling. We have a couple questions that are literally just an opportunity to tell us a story. And it's so fascinating, the people who, like, use that opportunity and tell us a story versus the people who have, like, a one-word answer. And you're like, but, but this is storytelling industry. Like, don't you want to tell a story? Definitely a, a great camera does not a filmmaker make. Oh, yeah. Absolutely It's not. so important. There's a, I did, again, I didn't go to film school, but all my, a lot of my friends did at the same college, and there's a story they always say, like, a great story could be shot on toilet paper and it'd That's still right. be watched. Yes. So I always thought that was something I'd take away. So um, I want to talk about um, kind of the, the programs in general um, and how, how, many peop how many students typically start and how many graduate. Okay, so yeah, that was given to me in advance. Um, I don't think I have an, I know that USC overall has a very high retention rate, like in the 90 percentile, 90th percentile, and I would think that the cinema school has something similar, but I don't really know a stat on that. Um, I think, you know, we have about 1,800 students at any given time between majors and minors um, in all of our divisions, and I think most of them graduate. Um, so I that's, think that's great. That much of that amount of retention is amazing. Yeah. Do you know uh, if NYU, do you have a, a uh, I don't I don't have the stats on that, but very high retention. I mean, we see the students when they come in, they, they stay with us. Being a startup, I have those numbers because <laughs> <laughs> when you, we're so small, everything is right in your face. Uh, we're, uh, our average semester is about 80 students. Uh, 80 students a year are our cohorts, and we expect to lose three to five a year. So we're expecting to lose less than 5%, and that's been sticking with us so far. I can give you analytics about our traffic, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> we get millions of students every month. <laughs> So I want to talk the difference between graduate school versus undergraduate school. And what a, is there a key difference? I think looking back on my career, I would have rather done undergrad in something you know, more like business. I got a business minor, but I wish I'd actually majored in that and then potentially gone at graduate school level because I'd know more about what I wanted to do. What is the program difference and the personality difference for undergrad versus graduate school? OK, I guess since I'm first, I keep going first, so sorry. Um, I think there's a big difference, at least um, at USC. So first of all, if you're an undergrad at any large um, liberal arts university, you're going to be taking all your general ed requirements, which basically are sort of half, easily half of the units you need um, in order to graduate. And then you don't get to the film part of your program as an undergrad to probably um, year three, like somewhere in your junior year. So then it's really super packed in. Be ready for a massive load of work if you didn't have one already. So I think it's just a different experience. Um, whereas on the grad level, if you can afford to go to undergrad and grad school, you come in there really more focused as a professional. You will know more about what you want to do. And you can, and that's all you're doing is whatever your chosen area is. I mean, uh, we have different grad, different pieces of our grad program. So you, it could be production, it could be games, it could be animation. So it is a very different experience. So doesn't mean you can have a career after undergrad school. You can, I did, um, and many people do. Um, but I think it's it's a very different experience, and you should really be looking at both opportunities. Yeah, I would say for the undergrad program, it might differ from the grad program in terms of some of the things students might study. We have uh, a bit more in the undergrad for animation, experimental filmmaking, uh, documentary, television studio production. The grad program, you come in and you hit the ground running, and you're, you're working to be a director. And you're working on that year in, year out. And you're done in three years with your thesis. 
So it's a much more concentrated, high, uh, high intensity program. And the undergrad is much more, you know, you've got four years to work through it and figure out what you want to do. Maybe go into a craft, maybe do directing. So there's definitely a difference there. I would, I would say going back to some stuff we said earlier about the connections you make, right? And first off, I, wanna, I wanted to say this earlier. One important thing to understand about those connections is it's with your other students, right? Like, it, at least in my experience, I didn't walk out of USC and no one was like, you've got a USC master's and I went there in 1980, you have a job. Like, the network is so vast that it's not like that. It's really the people that you're in school with. Like, you blink and all of a sudden it's 10 years after school and you went to school with someone running a production company and you went to school with someone show running and you went to school with all these people that are helping each other out and hiring each other and it's that community of your fellow students that's so important. And for me, I can't get that digitally because I'm a curmudgeon. Like, I get that in person. Real in-person experiences give me that community. And I had that community in undergrad, but it's with a whole bunch of people in a whole bunch of different industries. I have a friend who's a chef, and I have a friend who's unemployed magically, and I don't know how he does it. But, like, uh, so all of that is great. You, grad school, my community from grad school is everybody is in film. Like I said, you'll look around. One's a showrunner. One's running. One's at a studio. And that three years of working so intensely together and having those in-person, real-world meet space, as they said it in the 90s experiences, was a community I could only get out of grad school. Now, that said, the USC undergrads, when I was in grad school, are on fire and are doing way better than our cohort. Ace Norton, uh, Hiro Murai, Maura Milan, all of that undergrad cohort from when I was in grad school are, like, killing it. A so, lot of those guys uh, went to Crossroads High School with me in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, They're pretty okay. connected. Oh, wow. So I mean, I grew up in L.A., embedded in the industry, around people in the industry, and there's, a re there's a, just a reality. You have to be pretty lucky. Like, who's in your cohort or your class? I mean, the interesting thing that people don't talk about a lot is, like, who, uh, how many people come out of film school and have a career in film, make money in film? or in television or in entertainment. I don't know the numbers on that, but you have to be lucky on who's in your class and what they do, as well as who you know from other places and what they do. I mean, I have people I know from all parts of my life, including high school, who are doing all kinds of things, and, and a lot of it has nothing to do with their education. And that's just the reality of the world. So one last question, and then I want to give our audience opportunity in case they have any questions for you all. Um, and I want to get you, Michael and George. We kind of went down a little bit of a, a, a school-specific kind of thing here. Um, for all of you, if you could go back, would you go to film school or would you do something else? I'm on the fence. But I mean, I, I think I would have liked film school for what you're saying, meeting the people you're working with and seeing what you come out and having that bond and working together for 10, 20 years. And I like the idea of learning from people who've been there and done it. Uh, but these days, like that was 20, 30 years ago, these days with all the technology you have at your disposal, if I could afford it, I would seriously consider it. If money was an issue, I don't know because you can do a lot of that work on your own as well. So it's, it's a toss up. I can see pros and cons to both sides. I don't think there's a definite answer for everybody. Yeah, I would definitely reiterate. I think what I wish, and I don't think, you know, I, I think it, in hindsight, being 2020, I would have liked to work more sooner. Instead of thinking about things like, how am I gonna be a producer, a director, a writer, I would have liked to work on sets and learn and, and, and build the career through jobs. If, if I could go back, I didn't do that and I didn't go to film school. Um, but, I, but I think that, that learning is a good teacher and work is good and uh, you know hard to find, but like building your career and building up your experience that way um, in whatever it is you do. I think sometimes we look at uh, the film world and the entertainment world just in terms of the people at the very top. We don't think about things like camera people, uh, grips and electrics, and uh, gaffers, and uh, script coordinators. There's a lot of careers in entertainment that aren't director. I think I heard from a friend who went to USC that one of the first classes he sat in on, they talked about sound design, and they showed them Star Wars without the set finished sound, and they were like, not that many people in this room are gonna be directors. But you know, there's a lot you can learn about making movies and television that's not directing, and I don't know how many of them learned it, but. It's like, look at Star Wars. What is Star Wars without great sound design? I don't know. It's not Star Wars, you know? And that's not what the director and the writer did. So to me, there's a lot more to filmmaking than the things we think about than the, the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. Scott, what do you think? Would you go back to film school? I would absolutely go back to film school. And one thing that I would stress is study everything. I know it sounds crazy, but most filmmakers are curious about a lot of stuff. 
they, they have a passion for their art form, but they're also curious, I don't know, about history or about technology. And it's going to make you a better artist. So, yeah. Mary? Well, I don't know. Mine, I don't have a simple answer to that. I want to just say about what you just said that, you know, everybody comes to the USC School of Cinema wanting to, in production, wanting to be a director. Most of them do not end up being directors. Many of them go on to work in sound very successfully because there's probably about 10 of them each, you know, within each cohort that choose that and they get jobs at, in, at Skywalker in about five minutes. Um, so for me, I don't know, probably if I had all the choices in the world, I would do a liberal arts undergrad and go to film school as a grad student. Um, do I, at hindsight being 2020, I mean, in the end, I had a fine career. I didn't know, I also kind of didn't have the advantage of sort of the USC mafia, as we call it. <laughs> and I think that made it harder for me in my career. Um, and I think, um, so it would have been nice, but I did okay, and then I ended up at a film school, so there you go. Charles? So, I absolutely would have gone to film school, because I need, I, it takes me a very long time to connect with people. Like, there are those people who can go to a party once and make a lot of friends. I need long, like, meeting people seven times. So film school was great for me. By the second year, I felt like I really knew people. So we're not friends yet, then? I mean, it takes Because you don't seem shy. <laughs> you don't seem shy at all. Well, I, shy is the wrong word. It just takes me a long, it, ta it takes me a long time. I'm not, a, uh, I, I couldn't survive a big school. So film school was perfect for me, and I'm really glad I went. I will say this. I would make more informed financial decisions. I'm still paying my USC student loans. USC, like, this is something I didn't know until after grad school, but everybody should know. If you work in film, you're freelance, which means you're getting 1099 income, which means if you apply for a mortgage, your entire student loan is written off against your income. W-2 income, your student loan's not written off against it. So it changes everything about buying a house if you work in a freelance industry and you have student debt. This is a great idea for a class, by the way, at film school. Oh, With my like God. Like, finances in film school, like, I mean. is such a thing. So, like... If Fierstein existed, I would go to Fierstein. I, in, if, Fierstein if it was like back in 2002, I should have looked at UCLA more seriously. Literally, I walked to the USC campus and got a good vibe. I went to the UCLA campus and got a bad vibe, and I didn't even apply because I got a bad vibe, which like is insane considering the price differential. So I would, make a, I would do more financial research, but oh, I'd go to art film school again in a heartbeat. All right, great. Does anybody in the audience have any questions that we want to get to? Could I add one thing real quick on that? Of course. Research the school. Look at who's teaching. Yeah. Look at what they uh, specialize in. If you're here at NAB last year or this year, AI, machine learning, all this stuff, IBM Watson, Google, all these companies, NVIDIA, you should really know what's active on the ground in the program because one thing that happens in higher ed, it's institutional, and it lags behind technology. Not only just do we have the latest camera, do we understand the changing media landscape and what are we doing about it, whether it's a full-on class or a student club. Look and yeah. see and make sure that those wheels are turning at the school you want to go to way in advance of the notoriety of the school or, or kind of what, it, what its street cred is. Yeah, and I would say look at the faculty and because the faculty, um, many times the faculty who are leaders in some of these cutting edge industries will be adjuncts there. And those are the people you want to glom onto um, as a student. Any questions from the audience? Anybody have anything? Any thoughts? Oh. Miss, actually, yell it to me, and I'll repeat it so the online viewers can hear. I have no idea. I what? just walked on campus, and I got, like, the heebie-jeebies. The question was, was what like, made no USLA a bad vibe? But, yeah. Any, any, anyone else? Anybody questions? There were more bikes at USC. I remember <laughs> that. Everybody in USC was on a bicycle, and, and there I was like, still this place. are. <laughs> All right. In that case, I'll do my last question, and I'll ask you guys, please keep this one to just a couple sentences. I wanted to just kind of, and this is the, the last one. So taking into account that students are going to be paying off these loans for years, years to come. What is the net value that they take away from an arts program, graduate or undergraduate, like film school? Okay, um, I think I go back to my original, which is the ability to collaborate, the um, learning what your vision is and how to tell stories and um, networking with your colleagues, you know, your, your partners and bosses of the future. 
yeah, I would agree. And it's what I said in the beginning. Know who you are and know what you're about and where you want to go. Have some confidence in that. You're going to get out of film school. And believe it or not, I remember when I got out of film school, the first set I was on, they found out I went to NYU Tisch and they were like, okay, what do you know? And it's, I think it's funny. You think, you know, you've, you've just spent four years studying filmmaking and it, it kind of can backfire on you on set sometimes. So leave with some confidence, not overconfidence, but know who you are and know what you want to do and get a note card out and write down what you want to do year one, two, three, four, five, and make sure you're on it. Community of peers. I started a production company with a fellow USC alum. When I directed a feature, the DP was a USC alum. Like, so many points in my career, that community of, when I go to LA, I stay with a friend that's a USC alum. Like, that community of peers that's so rich 20 years later came from that experience. Yeah, I think if the right approach, anything you do can be an opportunity to learn and meet new people and, and create uh, relationships and uh, have a positive takeaway. And that's sort of a life approach and it can apply to film school or, you know, whatever you do. Four years of maturing in undergrad, you get out of high school surrounded by 14, 18 year olds. Now all of a sudden you're 18, 19, you're the youngest person there and you got to grow up really fast. And what went before especially if you're living away from home. You're gonna grow up fast and learn a lot, and it was a good experience for me. Well, thank you all very much for coming here, thank and thank you. you for our audience for watching. Uh, thank you also for joining us online and watching. You can see all the episodes of Adorama Live hey, on nofilmschool.com. So please, go join the conversation by leaving a comment. I'll see you on the next episode of Adorama Live on No Film School.